Hello, everyone. I think we should get started. Um, it is my uh, great pleasure, honor, and privilege to introduce today's seminar speaker, Dr. Martin Brand. Um, I know Dr. Brand for a long time because of his seminal work in mitochondria bioenergetics. Uh, Dr. Brand graduated in um, Britain, uh, Manchester Bachelor, and uh, Bristol PhD and did a seminal work in the lab of Dr. Albert uh, Leninger. We probably all read the biochemistry book. That's the Bible I always check, even nowadays. Um, so Dr. Brand did some seminal work uh, during postdoctoral period of time uh, at John Hopkins. Um, he actually changed our understanding of the mitochondria proton gradient because the um, he discovered that the proton gradient is, is uh, twice as much efficient than previously defined. And uh, following that, he returned back to Britain and become an assistant professor. The different names, I can't. Different names. <laughs> it's called uh, fellows and readers and group leaders. Um, it's like assistant professor, associate professor, and full professor. So he loved Britain and spent 30 years there and continued his. Uh, seminal work on mitochondria bioenergetics. Um, there are numerous things I can talk about, Dr. Brand, because, uh, he, but, but I don't want to waste much time. He, he needs very little in, inter, uh, introduction because people who work in mitochondria um, bioenergetics know his paper, his, his work. I want to single out a few things that I really appreciate. Um, uh, the reason is because Dr. Brand's work touch the fundamentals of mitochondrial biology. Uh, when I was a graduate student, I always laugh about mitochondrial biology, think that it's a black box. You can never decode what's going on <laughs> inside the mitochondria. It's boring. And that was almost 20 years ago. Now I realize that mitochondria is at the center of uh, every aging-related diseases. And, and I begin to appreciate how much a contribution uh, that Dr. Brand's work has made. Uh, among a few of the seminal achievements, it was his uh, discovery that the mitochondria proton gradient uh, can be manipulated and measure the, the, where the reactive oxygen species is produced, and, and that is seminal. And based on that, he developed a high throughput screening to screen compound that can attenuate mitochondrial oxidative stress. Mitochondrial oxidative stress is at the center of aging related diseases, and that's what he's going to present today. Another thing Dr. Brand's work made a major contribution is uh, the usage of a seahorse. You know, we probably use seahorse uh, more and more often nowadays, but the true experts actually know how to use a seahorse and, and continuously improving the usage of seahorse is Dr. Brand's work. Um, and uh, and, and um, without overdue, I um, warmly welcome Dr. Brand. Many thanks. So it's a pleasure to be here, and it's my first visit to San Antonio, so uh, really nice to see the environment and, and the facilities. What I want to talk about today is work that had its roots maybe 10 years ago, uh, asking the question, how do mitochondria make ROS reactive oxygen species? Uh, because, uh, as just alluded to, very often mitochondria are perceived as a black box. You poke them and either ATP or ROS comes out, and that's all you need to know about them. Uh, but I'm very interested in the mechanisms, and uh, once you understand the mechanism, you can then manipulate the system to get it to do what you want it to do instead of what uh, it does on its own. So that leads into the second part, how we can stop them doing this uh, activity. So if mitochondrial ROS production is bad, uh, maybe we can stop them doing it without stopping them doing all the other things which they do which are good. So I'm going to tell you that there is uh, at least 11 different sites within mitochondria that can make either superoxide or hydrogen peroxide. Uh, those are the two ROS that I'll be talking about when I talk about reactive oxygen species. Uh, and their contributions to the total change a great deal depending on exactly how you treat the system, either the isolated mitochondria or the cell. So you can't ask or answer the question, uh, 
which sites in mitochondria are the ones that make the ROS that I care about, uh, because it depends on what your system is and what the conditions are. So to try and unravel what's going on there, I'll talk about our models of near physiological conditions, where at least in the system we were looking at, uh, we can show that only four of those sites are the ones that we really need to worry about, and that's in uh, a model of skeletal muscle in rat. And then in the second half, I'll segue to the how can we stop them part of the talk, uh, which is to introduce these suppressors of electron leak cycles and sequels, uh, which suppress at particular sites without doing anything to oxidative phosphorylation. And I'll talk about some of the things that they do in biological systems uh, when we add them. And obviously, uh, where I'm coming from is the mitochondrial free radical theory of aging, and that's the relevance to aging. And the hard version of the mitochondrial free radical theory says that all aging is caused only by mitochondrial ROS production, and that there's a self-perpetuating feedback loop where the mitochondria make ROS, uh, that damages them so they make more mitochondria, that causes more ROS, and you get into this downward spiral. And I think nobody seriously takes that hard version of the theory uh, as, as the only explanation of aging these days. But nonetheless, there are a lot of aspects of mitochondrial radical production that are very relevant to aging. And I think we need to understand the process in more detail and depth and produce tools which allow us to examine it uh, more effectively before we can rule out even the hard version of the theory. What tends to be less controversial is the involvement of mitochondrial radical production and a whole host of aging related phenomena. And this is stolen from the internet and I forget where I stole it from, so one day somebody's gonna say it was me and I'll have to own up. Uh, but mitochondrial ROS production or more generally free radical oxidative stress uh, is involved in just about everything nasty that you can think of in about every tissue. And the ones in red are ones that uh, one way or another I'll just uh, mention as we go through. Uh, where the mitochondrial production of superoxide and hydrogen peroxide may be involved in, in cancer, in stroke, in neurodegenerative diseases, uh, in inflammation, in diabetes, in aging itself, uh, in heart function and ischemia reperfusion injury. So there's a whole host of scenarios where mitochondrial production of superoxide and hydrogen peroxide is implicated as being very, very important. And my feeling about that whole body of literature is it's kind of shaky. There's enough there to believe there's something going on. There's plenty of smoke. Uh, probably there's a fire at the base of it. But we need to understand the whole process better before we can really evaluate the degree to which mitochondrial superoxide production is driving or is involved in all these different age-related pathologies. So how do mitochondria make superoxide and hydrogen peroxide? Well, it, it's very simple. You take electrons, what did I do? You take electrons and you put them on oxygen and that generates various reduced oxygen species. And the canonical way that mitochondria do that is in cytochrome oxidase, where electrons are put on effectively four at a time through the four different redox centers in the cytochrome oxidase, and then handed on to oxygen in a complex set of reactions, which reduce oxygen uh, by four steps to harmless water. And it turns out that cytochrome oxidase is extremely well constructed, and it really doesn't leak electrons. So all you make is water. It's a harmless reaction, and there's really no radical production associated with cytochrome oxidase. However, there are two other ways that you can reduce oxygen. You can put electrons effectively in pairs, often one and then another one very quickly, to make hydrogen peroxide. Or you can put them on singly, uh, to make superoxide. And these are the two uh, forms of reactive oxygen species that I'm going to talk about and that are the ones that are implicated in uh, diseases and in aging itself. So the question is, how do mitochondria do this and can we stop them from doing it? This is my diagram of mitochondria and how they work. And it's kind of complicated compared to the nice friendly blob diagrams that you often see. And that's deliberate. It's to uh, elevate into the, my consciousness and yours the idea that there are different energy levels within the electron transport chain. So this is three planes of isopotential groups. Uh, 
arranged according to their redox potential from the very reducing uh, through the not quite so reducing to the relatively oxidizing right down to the oxygen water couple, which, which is a very oxidizing couple. And the normal mode of electron flow in mitochondria would be that metabolism gathers electrons from the, the TCA cycle, from beta oxidation, from other catabolic processes, feeds them in through a bunch of different enzymes uh, into the NADH, NAD pool, which is at this reducing potential in mitochondria. And those electrons are then fed through complex one, and they drop down in energy. And as they drop down in energy to this more oxidizing potential, you can harness some of that energy by proton pumping and generate proton motor force, which you then use to drive oxidative phosphorylation. So this is where you get the payoff, is as the electrons drop between the levels, you can harvest energy and use that to drive ATP synthesis. Some of the electrons that you can gather from catabolic reactions are not so reducing. So you can't feed them in the top. They don't have enough energy to, to hit this energy level. So you pick them up at the next energy level down at the isopotential group, which includes the, the ubiquinone QH2Q couple. So the classic example of that would be succinate. Succinate dehydrogenase just doesn't have enough thermodynamic push to put the electrons onto the top level, so they come in at this isopotential group. And they join the electrons coming down this waterfall from the the group above, they pass through respiratory complex three. Again, there's energy harvested to make ATP, and then through respiratory complex four, eventually the electrons do the four electron reaction to form water from oxygen. And these red dots are the different sites that have been identified by other labs and by our lab uh, at which electrons can leak out of this chain onto oxygen to make superoxide or hydrogen peroxide. And you can see they're scattered all around. They're predominantly in these more reducing parts of the chain, as you would expect. Only when the electrons are very reducing are they going to leak out and react with oxygen. When they're down here, they're much easier to control because they're less reducing. Uh, so you get much less superoxide or hydrogen peroxide production. Uh, some of them are in the dehydrogenases that feed in, particularly in the two oxo acid dehydrogenases, pyruvate dehydrogenase uh, or alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase of various other oxo-acid dehydrogenases. Some of them are in the dehydrogenases that feed in to this intermediate level of the isopotential group of the quinones, uh, particularly succinate dehydrogenase and glycerol phosphate dehydrogenase, but also the acyl-CoA dehydrogenase of fatty acid oxidation. And others of them are on the respiratory complexes themselves. There are, at least in my depiction of it, two different sites in complex one one where the flavin binds and one where the quinone binds. And there's some discussion about whether that's two sites or one site. I think it's two different sites. And there's a very important site in complex three where the quinone binds. And because there are all these different sites, we need to give them convenient labels so we can talk about them. Uh, so I give them names which are, uh, first of all, the, the name of the complex one or three. And then secondly, the name of the site where they interact. So site 1F is the flavin site in complex 1. Site 1Q is the quinone binding site in complex 1. Site OF is the flavin site in the 2-oxyglutarate dehydrogenase complex. Site 2F is the flavin site in succinate dehydrogenase. So I'll talk about site 1F, site 1Q, site 3QO, site 2F. And these are the ones I'm referring to, these uh, sites in the different complexes. Martin, can I ask a question, please? Please do. Uh, so I thought the uh, uh, 2-oxo dipate uh, went through the alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. Is that correct, or is there, has it got a dedicated 2-oxo uh, acid dehydrogenase? So that's the canonical answer, yes, that the 2-oxoglutarate dehydrogenase is exclusively how the 2-oxo adipate goes in it. It turns out that there's another member of the complex which you can pick up, of the complex family, which you can pick up from gene sequencing, and it's now becoming clear that actually there's a dedicated to oxo acid dehydrogenase for the two amino adipic acid. So that's, it still uses the E3, the yes. same E3, but it's got a dedicated E1 and E2? That's right, dedicated E1. Oh, wow. Well, no, I didn't know that. Thanks. And then one of the things I'm going to be talking about is reverse electron transfer. And this diagram is particularly helpful for explaining what I'm talking about when I do that. 
Reverse electron transfer is what it sounds like, that the electrons go backwards. They go in the wrong direction. And it happens if you, I'm doing it again. It happens if you feed electrons in to this intermediate redox state, let's say from succinate dehydrogenase. So the electrons that you feed in from succinate go in through complex two into the Q pool, and then they run down through complex three and complex four. Protons are pumped, uh, a large membrane potential and pH gradient are set up. But that large gradient that you've set up can then drive this pump backwards. So the proton motive force set up by these pumps can now drive the electrons from the Q pool by reverse flow back up into complex one. And by showing it on these different energy levels, it becomes a lot more obvious what you're doing. You're pushing something up against a waterfall. And that's why it's called reverse electron transport. So when you give mitochondria, when isolated, or as it turns out, various physiological and pathophysiological conditions, uh, when they're oxidizing succinate, you can get electron flow into the Q pool, and then driven by the proton motor force back up into complex one. And it turns out that this one Q site is a very important site, uh, both in isolated mitochondria, but also in pathophysiology, which is something of a surprise. So those are the sites, and we set out uh, maybe uh, eight, nine years ago uh, to try and measure them, to find out what their characteristics are, just so we, we get to know the characters in this play. And very quickly, we ran into a problem that the field has been bugged by for the last couple of decades, and that is that if you try and stop a site from working, the electrons simply redistribute and pop out somewhere else. So, for example, there are good inhibitors of each of these red dots here. There's good inhibitors of the Q binding site, that's rotenone. Uh, there's good inhibitors of the 3QO site in complex 3, that's mixothiazole. Uh, but when you add these inhibitors, what happens is the flow of electrons into the system still continues. Catabolism is still running. So electrons pile up behind this dam, and they start to come out of all these other red dots. So when you take a cell and you suppress or you inhibit the complex three site with mixothiazole, what actually happens is uh, the octoacid dehydrogenase suddenly start to make a lot more rust than they were doing before. Uh, so it becomes very difficult to assign the sites of rust production in, in cells by using the classical mitochondrial inhibitors. The other aspect of it is that when you inhibit, then all the centers downstream go oxidized. So if you take a cell and you add rotenone, if most of the substrate flow is in here, say from glycolysis and glucose going into the Krebs cycle, uh, then uh, the electrons back up here and these sites make more superoxide, uh, but these sites now uh, go oxidized. All of the electrons flow out down to oxygen and everything in here goes oxidized, and so those sites stop. So if you add rotenone to a cell and the ROS signal goes down, it may well be that it was the complex three site or the complex two site that was making the ROS and now it stops making it when you add the rotenone. So you have no specificity in these classic experiments where you add inhibitors of electron transport. And you even get the sign wrong sometimes. You could block off this site so it doesn't make superoxide, but you might be overcompensate by making even more from these other sites, and, and you might see uh, that the ROS goes up and you imply or you infer that uh, this site had negative contribution to the ROS production, which makes little sense. So how do we solve that problem? And we spent quite a lot of time working out how to do that. And the way we did it was to use endogenous reporters of the other sites. So the theory of this is, is based on the fact that uh, some of these isopotential groups are in close equilibrium uh, with the NADH, NAD pool, and, and the center. So the, the flavin site in complex one is in very close equilibrium with the NADH, NAD pool. And since the rate at which the flavin in complex one reacts with oxygen to make superoxide is a simple chemical reaction, it follows uh, bimolecular kinetics, uh, second order kinetics. So we can predict its rate if we know the NADH NAD level, which predicts the reduction state of this, certainly at constant oxygen. It's a unique function of the NADH NAD level. So by measuring the NADH NAD level, by running only this site, and then by doing a calibration experiment, we can relate the superoxide production from the 1F site specifically to the NADH NAD level. Then we go into some complex system like a cell, or at least into isolated mitochondria. We measure the NADH NAD level. We look up on our calibration how fast that particular site is going. And we can then correct for any changes in that site when we manipulate somewhere else in the system. 
So that's shown here with two endogenous reporters using the autofluorescence of NADH, NAD uh, as our marker of the isopotential group around NADH and using for the quinone isopotential group using the redox state of cytochrome B566, uh, which is in close association with this quinone binding site here. We can measure this by absorption spectroscopy. We can measure this by endogenous fluorescence. So we devise clever inhibitor and substrate experiments. So we drive just the 1F site in complex 1. We vary it by changing the electron input, and we plot out the relationship of that site, how fast it goes with the NADH reduction state. It's this one here in the sort of purpley, bluey dots. Similarly, for the 3QO site in complex 3, we can shut everything off with inhibitors, measure just that site, uh, measure the B redox state, uh, vary the redox state, which varies the ROS production, measured as H2O2, uh, and produce a calibration curve. And then once we have those two endogenous reporters, we can now go into mitochondria in any condition, measure the reporters, and say, okay, this site's going this fast, this site's going that fast, and everything else has to be accounted for by other sites. And that turns out to be a very effective and powerful way to... Uh, first of all, correctly measure the different sites. And then in complex systems where we have complicated uh, substrates or complicated energetics going on, to find out how fast all of the sites, all of the 11 sites, are going under any physiologically uh, relevant or mimicking condition. These experiments are in mitochondria isolated. Yes. Yes. Exactly that. So we're using rat skeletal muscle mitochondria as our model to understand how the system works. Once we've, I hope, persuaded you that we've understood it, we're then going to transition into cells uh, where we start to look at effects in more biologically relevant or a wider range of biologically relevant systems. So at the moment, we're just characterizing the system to find out, well, what can it do? Uh, so first of all, looking at the NADH, NAD isopotential group, uh, we can demonstrate that uh, within that group, there's a wide range of different capacities. So we drive the mitochondria to run a particular site as fast as it can go. We tweak the conditions until we can't get it to go any faster, and we call that the maximum capacity of the site. And the first surprise is that the flavin site in complex one, that's the one that you will read about most of all in the literature about mitochondrial ROS production, has almost no capacity to make superoxide and hydrogen peroxide. It's a very low capacity site. Uh, the oxyglutarate dehydrogenase, alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, is maybe 10 times more powerful as a ROS producing site in principle than the flavin site in complex one. And when you go back and look at the literature, most of the experiments, including ones from my lab, where we assigned uh, the ROS production to the flavin site in complex one, it's almost certainly coming from either the oxyglutarate dehydrogenase or the pyruvate dehydrogenase. We, we got it wrong in our early experiments for the first five years. So we think the oxoacid dehydrogenases have much higher capacity than the flavin in complex one for making radicals. And that has a lot of knock-on effects for interpretation of, of all sorts of parts of the literature. This is the reverse electron transport site in complex one. So we feed electrons in by succinate, and we measure how fast this uh, putative quinone binding site in complex one can run. And it's bigger than all these other sites. And you can see in particular it's spectacularly faster than the flavin site in complex one. So when complex one is being driven backwards, it can go maybe 50 times faster in terms of making superoxide than it can when it's going forwards. And that's under our optimization of the best conditions to make either the reverse or the forward reaction go. Uh, so the capacity of complex one going backwards is, is high. And then this analyzes the characteristics of the electron transport uh, leak pathways in the QH2Q isopotential group. And the classic complex three site has a huge capacity. It's twice the size of any other site. So the other main site that you read about in the literature, the complex three site, is actually hugely able to make superoxide compared to the flavin site in complex one. There's a vast difference between them. And then the big surprise to us is that complex two, which is hardly ever talked about as a ROS producing enzyme, is actually the second highest capacity site that we can find in these muscle mitochondria. 
complex two is very able to make large amounts of superoxide uh, if you drive it under the right conditions. And that's the trick. If you give it lots of succinate as the substrate, it binds to the active site and masks the ROS production. What you have to do is to give it a very low amount of succinate or feed the electrons in backwards out of the cupel. And then you can really see that the complex two site can run. So it can make very large amounts. So the sites with the largest capacities then are the complex three Q binding site, the 2F site in complex two and the reverse electron transport site in complex one, followed by others of which the, the largest is the oxo acid dehydrogenase, is particularly uh, oxoglutrate dehydrogenase. And trailing in next to last is the flavin site in complex one as a low capacity site. And what I've uh, put out on the top is a diagram that shows with about the current level of precision the topologies of those sites. Which side of the membrane are they actually making the superoxide or the hydrogen peroxide to? And the scale goes from zero to 100 and they're all at 100 except for two of them. So all of these sites except the two uh, will make superoxide or hydrogen peroxide directly into the mitochondrial matrix where the mitochondrial DNA is. So those are the ones that are able to directly damage DNA using uh, superoxide. But two of the sites, uh, they're color-coded, so the uh, 3QO site in complex three and the glycerol phosphate site in glycerol phosphate dehydrogenase itself are actually able to make about half their superoxide to the outside, to the intermembrane space. So that has huge implications. If the superoxide itself is doing something because it effectively doesn't cross the mitochondrial inner membrane. If that superoxide is being made by the complex three site, it can do things directly into the cytoplasmic, or at least the intermembrane space compartment. Whereas if some of the other sites are running, uh, for example, the, the one Q site, uh, then it can only do things in the matrix, at least in terms of superoxide. And the only way it can access the rest of the cell, at any uh, large rate at least, as far as we know, is after conversion to hydrogen peroxide by the superoxide dismutase in the matrix, and then that hydrogen peroxide can come out and can do things in the cell. So the way that these sites are going to play depends on which site is running. Some of them will be able to do superoxide-y things in the cytosol, and others will never be able to do that. Um, yeah. So a couple of questions for you. This is really fascinating to me, uh, mainly because it overlaps with a lot of work that, that we found uh, in our worm mutants. Um, uh, we've been studying the long live uh, C. elegans mutants, and we found uh, accumulation of, all, uh, of many uh, oxo keto acids, and, and of course indicating that, suggesting that those branch chain keto acids, the dehydrogenases, are built, uh, blocked. But um, within the alpha keto acid, uh, sorry, within the uh, two oxo glutarate dehydrogenases, you've got the branch chain keto acid dehydrogenase. Uh, the alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase and pyruvate dehydrogenase, and now this uh, two oxo adipate that you said. Number, first question: Do you find uh, any differences in their relative uh, ad uh, ability to produce ROS? Uh, and then, secondly, clear me up because I didn't quite catch what you said. Complex two was only a producer of ROS uh, when succinate's not loading the active site. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. So take the second one first. Uh, when people like me do mitochondrial experiments, they shovel in five or 10 millimolar succinate so everything goes fast. And that's a very good inhibitor of the ROS production at the flavin site of complex two. So you have to use low succinate before you see anything. And if you use it at physiological concentrations at one or 200 micromolar, uh, then you get these high rates that are in this slide here. So this, this can be achieved with say 150 micromolar succinate as the substrate. So you have to keep the succinate low, but then you can really see that site go. And those are the physiological concentrations of succinate. Malate can also occupy that site, and oxalacid obviously can go in there and uh, inhibit it. So there are other ways and other metabolites that can also decrease it. And when we got to this stage of the project, it wasn't obvious whether the 2F site was ever going to run in cells. I'll show you in a minute that we think it does, and it's a very important site in cells. And then the other question, uh, I think yours question was what I would describe as capacities. What, what are the relative capacities of the different sites if you push them to their maximum? And that's what this slide shows, that the oxyglutrate dehydrogenase can go at 100 and, uh, 1,000 and uh, 200 or whatever this is, uh, whereas the 
the branch chain keto acid dehydrogenase, at least in muscle mitochondria, goes at a rate of whatever this is, 300 or something. Obviously, okay, obviously, it will depend on the enzyme complement of your particular mitochondria. So if the mitochondria have a huge amount of glycerol phosphate dehydrogenase, as brown adipose tissue mitochondria do, then this site will come up in capacity. And if there's very little of the oxoacid dehydrogenases, they'll go down. So the relative capacities are tissue dependent. And I'm only talking about muscle mitochondria because that's the lamppost that we looked under. So everything I've talked about so far is capacities. This is like the Vmax of an enzyme. We're going in there and saying, what are the Vmaxes of all the glycolytic enzymes just so we can get a handle on what's possible. Um, and everything, I keep doing it, I apologize. Everything I've said is capacity up to now. Because we, we don't care about capacity. Uh, we don't care what the Vmaxes of glycolysis are. We care about how fast is glycolysis going. Uh, in the same way, we don't care in that sense about the capacities of the, the ROS producing sites. They're very useful if you want to study mechanisms, and that's why we, why we started there. They're good for comparing uh, the potential of different sites and different tissues to go. Um, they're obviously, as I'll show you, in a, very good in running screens. You want to run under very high flux conditions. And in principle, if you have some pathology, if you discover that the capacity of a site has gone down tenfold, that's a candidate for that site going slower in vivo. But it doesn't show you that it actually does go slower. So what I want to turn to now is the native rates. Um, we struggled to find the right word for this, and we came up with native, and some, some people have objected to it. Uh, this is equivalent to the, to the small v in enzyme kinetics. It's the actual rate. So the question I'm now going to turn to is how fast do these sites actually go? And I'm going to do it first of all in an isolated mitochondria with artificial substrates, and then an isolated mitochondria where we give substrates that we think are what they would actually see in a cell, and then finally we'll go into things where we ask the question in cells, which is actually a very difficult question. So these things are, the native rates are very useful for uh, asking questions and getting a handle on when will the mitochondria in your cell make more radicals? Um, which substrates would you have to add to get a lot of radical production? Uh, if you increase ATP demand, will they change how much uh, ROS they make? Will they all change in the same way? Will some change in one way, some change in another? Uh, and now, if you model something under some condition you think is related to physiology, it uh, becomes much more likely if you see a site increase. Even if its capacity has stayed the same, if it now goes 10 times faster, than it did before, this is a potential player in, in your pathology. Uh, aging, obviously, being one of the pathologies that we care about. So we started by looking at the native contributions of different sites in isolated muscle mitochondria. Uh, we used the conventional substrate, succinate. Uh, I think this was at a, a low concentration of succinate. And then we used the endogenous reporters to allow us to uh, read off those calibration curves so we could say, when we give isolated mitochondrial succinate, how fast is complex one going, complex three, etc. Uh, so we can measure the NADH, NAD, uh, red up state in the mitochondria, read off the calibration curve, and when you give mitochondrial succinate, the flavin site in complex one hardly does anything. The uh, 3QO site in complex three hardly does anything. So those are the two sites that regularly get talked about, and they're really not contributing in this condition. And then by difference, which is why it adds to 100%, um, and also by experiment where we look at the rotenone sensitivity and we correct for any changes in other sites, we can say that the dominant site under this condition is the reverse electron transport site into complex one, the 1Q site. That's been known in the literature before. What we've done here is to quantify the absolute contribution uh, and compare it to the contributions of other sites. So if you give mitochondria succinate, mostly it's this uh, Q-binding site in complex one that's generating superoxide. We can do that with other different substrate combinations, conventional ones, so we can add glycerol phosphate as the substrate or fatty acid substrates, palmitol carnitine, or we can add classical NAD-reducing substrates like glutamate and malate. And there are two take-homes from this. One is that the absolute rates are very different. So you can get very different rates of native ROS production from your mitochondria, depending on what substrates they see. And presumably, that's also true in cells, that if you give them different substrates in the cells, 
these sites will run at different rates. And the second take home is that the composition of that ROS production is very different. So with succinate, the dominant site is the quinone binding site in complex one. When you run glycerol phosphate, you do get some reverse electron transport, uh, but uh, the 2F site, this orange color here, the, the complex two site, now runs backwards. The, the electrons go from glycerol phosphate into the Q pool and then back out into the succinate dehydrogenase and make about a quarter of the total ROS signal. Uh, but when you use fatty acids as substrate, now electrons are coming in at both levels. Now this 1Q site doesn't run. Uh, we get no signal from it. Uh, instead, it's the, uh, the, the 1F site, the 3QO site, and the 2F site, which are roughly equal contributors. And with palmitol carnitine, we see much less ROS than we do with other conventional substrates. We kind of expected we'd see more because the literature talked about fatty acids as very ROS generating substrates, uh, but we never find that in, in any situation. And when we use glutamate and malate, again, we get different players. Uh, now the oxo acid dehydrogenase has come up, and we see OF as the biggest single site. Again, done by difference, so that accounts for the, the nice matching of the, the two sets of bars. So these, these are done, so the question is, are they done at equivalent concentrations of substrate? The answer is no. The, these are standard mitochondrial substrate levels where you shovel in whatever the literature shovels in. Uh, so I think it's five or, five or 10 millimolar succinate in this one. It's, I think, 20 millimolar glycerol phosphate with calcium here. It's very low levels of buffered palmitol carnitine, and it's probably five millimolar glutamate, five millimolar malate. Deliberately done because these are the classic sort of things that you would do with isolated mitochondria. So Martin, if you do, if you do this experiment in diabetic uh, obese tissues, would you say percentage in profile? So that's the, the standard approach, which we also have done with aging, with different species, with different um, pathologies. And I think it's kind of a waste of our time to have done them, because these are artificial substrates that they would never see. So who cares if when you give them succinate, they go faster. That probably just represents that they have more complex two or, or something like that. It's a, an epiphenomenon of the real biology that you're interested in. And I'll, I'll get on in the next section to a better way, I think, which is harder to do, but, but I think better, which actually directly addresses that problem. So the problem here is we don't care about isolated mitochondria oxidizing artificial amounts of substrates. What we care about is what's going on in real biology. And it turns out that to do the real biology is difficult. So the stepping stone to that is to try and pretend that isolated mitochondria are real biology. And, and that is, another way to phrase that is to say, well, what would these muscle mitochondria actually see when they were sitting in a muscle? And one of the nice things about using rat muscle as our model is there's a wonderful literature going back into the 1960s uh, where people have extracted and ground up and measured all the metabolite levels that you could imagine under a whole range of different conditions. So there's a rich literature we can go back into. As an aside, if you go into the metabolomic literature, it doesn't agree with this classic literature very well at all. So we don't go into the metabolomic literature. I think it's not well enough controlled. Uh, but what we have is calculated concentrations in the cytosol and making assumptions about the cytosol to mitochondrial distribution based on experiments done in a few tissues with a few of the substrates. And I've picked up all of the things that, from my playing around with mitochondria, are likely to matter. And an obvious caveat is, if I didn't know about something, it's not in the list, so it won't be included in the experiments. So there's a potential um, omission of something that matters that nobody knows about yet. And you can see that uh, muscle mitochondria in situ see a whole range of different substrates, um, amino acids, TCA cycle intermediates, ketone bodies, glycerol phosphate, shuttle intermediates, and a whole range of other things, ATP phosphate, sodium, uh, magnesium, calcium, and pH, all of which can affect the superoxide production. And that literature also exists for various versions of what I've called mild, mild exercise, which is less than exhaustion, and intense exercise, which is something which approaches exhaustion. Uh, so we, we can also say that the metabolites change during exercise. And what might happen, and what we thought would happen, is during exercise, where we know that 
there is an increased ROS signal in skeletal muscle, that the increases in these substrates, perhaps succinate going from 200 to 300 micromolar, might be sufficient to increase the ROS production. And we might get an increased native rate, which would explain the exercise ROS production that we see. So we did an analysis of the native rates in these substrate mixes mimicking rest and mimicking exercise. And in exercise, you have ATP turnover. Uh, so we set that empirically uh, by varying the amount of the ATP re ADP regenerating system in the medium. Uh, so this is the mitochondria in a mix of all those substrates with oligomycin there to stop any ATP turnover because in our mitochondrial preps, which are crude, there's quite a lot of myosin ATPase. So there's quite a fast ATP turnover rate. Uh, but we can stop the effect of that by poisoning the mitochondrial ATP synthase. So this is mitochondria not making ATP, which we call rest crudely, incubated in the medium appropriate for rest from muscle. This is if we don't add the oligomycin. Uh, first of all, there's a rapid ATP production as they use the ADP that's been generated in this small window here. And then they go into steady state where the mitochondria make ATP, the contaminating actomyosin complex hydrolyzes it again, and the mitochondria remake it. And that gives us an intermediate rate that we've arbitrarily called mild aerobic exercise because it's about the, the right fraction of uh, VO2 max. And then we can add a, an ADP regenerating system, glucose hexokinase, to drive this thing almost at Vmax, uh, which we've called our intense uh, aerobic exercise. And these are the respiration rates, rest, mild exercise, intense exercise, and this is uncoupled or uh, overt state three, which is just a little bit higher. So we're running just under the maximum VO2 max of the mitochondria. And then in these complex media, we can now measure the total uh, H2O2 ROS production with our Sinamplex Red or Swedish peroxidase assay for H2O2 in the medium. And what you can see is that at rest, there's a rate. If we go into mild exercise, it goes down, not up. And if we go into intense exercise, it goes down even more. Uh, so these are plotted out here. So in our mimic of exercise, done as best we can to mimic what really happens in a muscle, when the muscle exercises, the mitochondria make less ROS, not more. Uh, that was a surprise to us, but that's a robust finding. Uh, and either we're wrong because we've missed out some factor that matters, uh, or we're right, in which case mitochondria are not the source of the ROS production that you see during exercise by various probes. It must come from NADPH oxidases or some other system. So the, what was the exercise part on the model? So the exercise model is we take the metabolite concentrations from the literature for exercising muscle, rapidly freeze clamped and then analyzed by classic methods. We run the mitochondria uh, with an ADP regenerating system to mimic the, the, the muscle we adjust the calcium and the pH to the levels that you find in exercising muscle. And we say this is the, our best guess of what the mitochondria would see in an exercising muscle. And it's not exercising muscle, it's our best guess. And that's the caveat. But within that caveat, this is the answer. Yeah. So what happens if you put lactate in the system? This is isolated mitochondria. So they don't care about lactate. It's, it's just dead to them. Uh, with cells, that would do things, but this is a, a cell-free system. We mimic the effects of pH by um, changing the pH of the medium, so that aspect of it we do take into account. So now we can use our endogenous reporters to say, okay, who's making it under this pseudo-physiological condition and who changes when it goes down? Uh, this just puts it in context. So we're now talking about here's the, here's the rest value and the exercise value compared to these capacities. And you can see that the sites have much greater capacity than the actual rates. So any of these sites uh, which have greater or equal to this uh, native rate could in principle be the cause of it. So you don't a priori know from the capacities which, con which sites are going to contribute. And that's a simple fallacy that we and others have always fallen into. If it's big, it must be important. That, that's not necessarily true. It might be that one of these minor sites, uh, say the flavin in complex one, is actually a significant contributor to exercise because the rates are within a factor of two equivalent. And here's the answer. It's quite a, a long and hard experiment. Uh, 
but what we find is that the, there are four sites that dominate under rest. The, the fifth one, the ETF fatty acid system, is quite error prone, so I don't really believe that. Uh, but these four are pretty robust. And those sites are the reverse electron transport site in complex one. That's a surprise. Reverse electron transport is not supposed to be going on in a muscle. Um, maybe it's not actually reverse electron transport. Maybe if you're putting electrons into the Q pool, then the electrons stall as they try and come down that waterfall. And so they start to make ROS at the one Q site. And we think that's probably what's going on there. Uh, the biggest site, quantitatively, although these are all the same within the errors, is actually the complex two site. The Flavin site in complex two is making a huge amount of ROS in our mimic of resting muscle. That's a big surprise. No one really expected that to be an important player. And then the two conventional sites are there, so the complex three site. And then the one I've been disparaging up to now for being puny actually uh, is running near full capacity. So the Flavin site in complex one, although it has a very low capacity, is running very near that maximum capacity. The NADH is kept pretty reduced uh, in this system. Uh, so it actually contributes as much as any one of these other sites. So in our best guess of, of rest in muscle, there are four sites we care about. Uh, two of them in complex one, the Q-binding site and the Flavin site, one in complex two and one in complex three. When we go into exercise, what happens is uh, the substrate effects hardly matter. So we thought if we shovel in more succinate, more amino acids, more other things, maybe that will uh, cause increases. Uh, no, what happens is it, it makes no difference. Uh, the dominant effect is that the electron transport chain goes more oxidized because it's turning over faster as you go into state three or, or closer to state three. So the electrons run out to oxygen faster and everything within the mitochondria goes more oxidized. So all of the sites that really care about the Q-redox state or the protometer force, which is all of these above the green one, all go effectively at, at no rate. Most of this is now within the noise. Uh, so they go very slow or maybe at zero rate. Uh, but the Flavin site in complex one just keeps plugging away. It, it doesn't, the NAD pool doesn't go very oxidized. And so the site hardly changes its rate. So the, the single site that dominates during exercise is actually this complex one flavin site, according to this analysis. So a bunch of surprises. Every time we got a result, we were surprised. Uh, but I think a very illuminating uh, suggestion, at least, of what might be going on in vivo, and a starting place to think about what might be going on in vivo. These look like the sites that we should care about, at least in muscle, according to our assumptions. So this is summarized for anyone that fell asleep. Big red arrow, it matters. So these four sites matter. Forget the rest, at least in muscle. They don't seem to be running under the conditions that we look at. Only four sites we need to worry about. So now I want to segue into the second part, which is how can we stop it? So let's ride with the idea that muscle is, all tissues are like muscle and that our mitochondria in a dish are like real muscle. And if you are willing to suspend disbelief on that, we now know that those four sites are the ones that we care about. Uh, now I'm segueing to, well, can we stop them doing it? And the answer is, of course, we can stop them doing it. We can poison the mitochondria with rotenone or mixothiazole, and they'll stop doing it. There are two problems with that. One I talked about, which is that when you do that, the electrons squirt out somewhere else. So you may stop that site, but other sites may take, may take over. And the second and obviously more worrying one is that you stop the mitochondria from making ATP, and that matters to biology, whether your mitochondria can make ATP or not. So any experiment you do in cells where you use rotenone or antimycin to poison the cell potentially or actually suffers from the problem that you've messed up the bioenergetics, the cell is behaving entirely differently, and whatever you find is not related to the thing that you were trying to find out. So we decided that we would screen for molecules which could suppress electron leak uh, at specific sites, so SEL for suppressed electron leak. And the sites we cared about are the 1Q site, the 1F site, the 3QO site, the 2F site. We also did the glycerol phosphate dehydrogenase site because that might matter in some tissues. Uh, so we did a positive screen for any compound we could find in the library which was able to stop those sites specifically from uh, making superoxide or hydrogen peroxide. And then we did a counter screen is we don't want them to interfere with electron transport, ATP synthesis. Uh, 
We want the bioenergetics to continue as before. So we screened for membrane potential. And we thought that would be very sensitive. And after we did it, it wasn't very sensitive. Uh, so we had to go back and redo it by other assays. The, the respiration is actually a much more sensitive assay for that. Uh, but in principle, we're looking for, and we found, compounds which don't affect the energetics and specifically affect one of these sites. And the big advantage of multiplexing it is that anything that screws up our assay or that uh, wrecks the antioxidant defenses of the mitochondria will show up as a hit in every assay. So we throw out anything that shows up in more than one assay. And by definition, uh, something that's a hit in this assay uh, but isn't a hit in the other assays is not affecting this assay by any common thing that's present in the assays of all of them. It's working at something specific on this particular site. We did an in-house screen of a few thousand compounds, decided that was too much like work, but it gave us a proof of principle that such molecules exist. It wasn't necessarily obvious that such compounds could exist. We're asking a rather complicated thing here, that a, mo a small molecule should be able to bind, let's say, to complex three, stop it from e leaking electrons to oxygen to make superoxide, but not stop it from doing the day job. Uh, but it turns out that they're very common, these hits. They're very easy to find. And it's very easy to find molecules that can have this selective suppression property. Um, and then we collaborated with GNF, which is an offshoot of Novartis in San Diego. And they screened for us using our assays their uh, chemical library of 635,000 small molecules. And they are professionals at screening, so they did in a week what uh, we had managed to do in three months to get 3,000 done. So we were very pleased that we did that. And this shows the, the, the first round hits on a, a threefold axis for three of the sites where we got uh, nice hits. So things that suppressed 3QO are in green, uh, 2, 2F are in yellow, 1Q are in blue. And this is the Venn diagram. Uh, so we got many thousand compounds. We got far too many 1Q hits, and when we went back, we discovered that a lot of them are weakened couplers, and that will decrease the proton motor force, and that'll stop the 1Q site from running. Once we triaged all of them, then we got this down to, again, 100 or a couple of 100 primary hits. So, uh, in the, um, I wonder, commonly, uh, what ones that are made could be repurposed? You know, uh, you know, drugs? In, in the, the first screen we did in-house, the first thing we did was all NIH-approved drugs. And lots of things show up as hits in, in that library, resveratrol. Uh, you name your favorite anti-aging compound, it shows up as a hit. But they were all messy. They did stuff we didn't understand. They hit several different sites, for example. So maybe they're doing something to the antioxidant defenses. And so we tossed a coin and decided not to follow up on those. The compounds I'm going to talk about turn out to be very selective. And although we don't know what they've been screened against in the past, they've been screened against quite a lot, and they don't show up as hits in anything else. And this shows the, the ones that are selective for the 3QO site in complex 3. So we call them suppressors of 3QO electron leak, or sequels. So the sequels are specific for the 3Q site, the site in complex 3. And this shows you our three best series of hits, three quite separate background, background structures, uh, different chemical structures, but all of them shared the property of able to take out the signal from the 3QO assay and having no effect on any of the other assays, uh, all the way up to uh, the highest concentration we measured in every case. So these are compounds which are able to selectively stop 3QO from making superoxide, and they don't do anything else, as far as we know, in mitochondria or in cells. As far as we know is important because this is early days and who, who knows, we might yet stumble on something. The main defense we have against that is because we have three different families, the only thing they have in common is they appeared as hits in our screen. So if we find all three of them do something in a cell, probably it's an on-target effect. It'd be, we'd be very unlucky if all three of them hit the same off-target effect given how we got hold of them, which is a specific screen against this particular assay. So we have very good sequels, or quite good sequels, which have uh, IC50 values in the sub-micromolar range, which are able to selectively prevent complex 3 from making superoxide without doing anything else. And the most obvious thing we care about is oxidative phosphorylation. So this is a seahorse experiment just showing respiration rate in state 2, state 3, and state 4. 
uh, you can't see the detail, but you can see the principle that uh, with any substrate, there's no effect of the compounds on any of these rates. So they don't do anything to uh, state three respiration. They don't do anything to uh, membrane potential. They don't do anything to any of the other bioenergetic measures that we've made. Of course, we did, found com we did find compounds that do do things, and those were thrown out uh, during the selection. We're still on isolated mitochondria. We're about to transition into what you want to hear about. Uh, but everything up to now is establishing the specificity, the, the um, trustworthiness of the compound. So that was the, the sequels. We also did the same thing with the cycles, the 1Q uh, suppressors. Uh, so this large blue blob, as I say, the, the first thing was to get rid of all of the ones that have a mild uncoupling effect. Uh, but when we did that, we still had candidates, and we went through, and we have equally good cycles, compounds that can prevent that 1Q ROS production without doing anything else that we can measure, uh, or at least nearly anything else that we can measure at a bioenergetic level. So the recap of that is, of these four sites that look like they're important, two of them we can selectively take out without doing anything else. Okay, so what do they do if you now start throwing them at biology? Uh, the first thing is they work across a range of different systems. So we can feed them to flies and get effects. So they work in insect mitochondria. Uh, they work in human cells. They work in all of the different cell types that we've used. And they do stuff. And I'm going to quickly skim through a number of different things that they do. Uh, the green one is things that you might call basal. So we take cells, we treat them primary cells so that they can't adapt to high oxygen. We treat them as nicely as we possibly can. We put them in a dish at 3% oxygen. Uh, we culture them for 48 hours, and then we ask, is there any signal coming out um, from these cells? And the answer is, yes, there is. Uh, in particular, the, the 1Q site, the most surprising of the sites, seems to be running in these cells when we've not done anything nasty to them at all. The blue ones and this one, which is intermediate, are ones where it's a, it looks like a signal pathway that we're intercepting. And I'm going to tell you briefly about um, hypoxic signaling through the HIF-1 alpha system and about uh, hyperplasia after ER stress. And one of the things that's coming out of this is it looks like there's a very strong pathway from ER stress to mitochondrial ROS production out into the cell to signal. And we can intercept that with the cycles and the sequels. And that, that was also a surprise, but that's very robust. And then the red ones are over damage. So if we damage pancreatic beta cells uh, during preparation, we can protect them by preventing uh, 3QO ROS production. And the most recently, we can uh, strongly impact ischemia reperfusion injury in heart uh, by using the cycles, uh, supporting the idea that 1Q ROS production is the primary driver of damage in ischemia, reper ischemia reperfusion. Am I doing on time here? I'm okay. And then again, just to remind you, the topology matters. Uh, so when we're running site 3QO, which we can suppress with the sequels, uh, the superoxide is being made to both sides of the membrane. So we can have cytosolic effects, which could be due to superoxide, uh, or it could be turned by various peroxidases or um, but by, by peroxidases into hydrogen peroxide outside, which could do things. Uh, we also have superoxide being made into the matrix, about 50-50, and SOD2 in the matrix can convert that into H2O2, which can come out and have cytosolic effects. So every time a sequel has an effect, it could be either of these. Uh, with the cycles, it's exclusively matrix-directed, so whenever a cycle takes something out, we're talking about an event that started in the mitochondrial matrix. And if we see a cytoplasmic effect, we presume it's H2O2 coming out of the mitochondria that's driving that cytosolic effect. So this shows the, the primary astrocyte experiment. So we make primary astrocytes from neonatal uh, pups, uh, mouse pups. Um, we culture them in this experiment at 20% oxygen, but it also works the same at 3% oxygen. And then we measure an index of ROS in the matrix. And as I've said to several of you today when we're talking, I don't trust any of the ROS probes. Uh, 
So whenever we use the conventional ROS probes, things go wrong in various ways. Um, so we're, we're trying to find probes that we think work. And one of them that works is succinate dehydrogenase activity. So there's an iron sulfur center in succinate dehydrogenase. And that gets completely wiped out if you use a, a SOD2 knockout mouse. And what's wrong with a SOD2 knockout mouse is that the superoxide dismutase in the matrix is absent. So in principle, everything is the same except that there's a lot of superoxide in the matrix. And that wipes out the SDH activity. Uh, so in these wild type animals, we can use the SDH activity in the matrix as a monitor of the superoxide levels in the matrix. So we start at 100% activity of the enzyme in, in an untreated control. And then as we titrate, titrate in the cycles into these unmolested cells, the SDH activity goes up by 50%. So this is cycles there for, for the full three or four days of culturing. Um, and we can protect the amount of SDH. So our interpretation of that is that uh, life is causing uh, site 1Q in these cells to make sufficient amounts of superoxide into the matrix that are damaging the, superox uh, damaging the succinate dehydrogenase. And presumably it's turning over and we're measuring a steady state level of damage and repair or damage and resynthesis. When we add the cycles which stop that and as far as we know don't do anything else, uh, then we take away the damage part of that cycle so the steady state levels go up. And we think that's what we're measuring. We see the same thing with sequels. Uh, we, we get some additivity between them. We're still working on that. So we think that both complex three and complex one are making significant amounts of superoxide into the matrix in a cell treated as gently as we possibly can. In other words, by extension, all cells. 3QO and 1Q are making ROS into the matrix. It's a big extension, obviously, but we've got an N equals one example. The signaling pathways, so we're switching system. This is now hypoxia in hex cells. Uh, if you treat cells with low oxygen, then as many of you know, uh, you get a big increase in the, the levels of the HIF1 alpha protein, which is stabilized under those conditions. And we set that increase in hypoxia at 100%. And it's well known you can take out that signal with mixothiazole. So that inhibits the 3QO site, and it does two things. It stops the ROS from that site. And it also screws up everything in the cell. And the interpretation of those experiments in the literature is it's the ROS effect that matters. And we said, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when we use the sequels, which suppress the ROS from that site without doing the ATP things, then we can also take out this HIF-1 activation. So we think that the literature in this case was correct, that the 3QO site is making superoxide or hydrogen peroxide probably eventually into the cytosol, and that's driving the HIF-1 system in hypoxia. And we think that the sequel experiment is really strong evidence for that. Uh, this is a gene expression readout showing the same thing, that we can prevent downstream gene activation in the same system. So the model here is that hypoxia is by some mechanism that we simply don't understand. It makes no sense, except possibly through uh, alterations in succinate level or other intermediate levels. Uh, but it's driving uh, the 3QO site to make ROS, and that's leading to the HIF-1 alpha response, either directly through superoxide or indirectly through H2O2. And of course, there could be other proteins in here before you get to HIF-1 alpha. And that leads to the hypoxic response. So mitochondrial ROS is driving hypoxic signaling, and we can stop that by using the sequels. This is an in vivo example. Uh, where we are collaborating with Henry Jasper's lab in the Buck Institute, and we're measuring the effect on gut stem cell hyperplasia in Drosophila. So one of the ideas about uh, ER stress in flies is that um, there's an ER stress signal which leads to hyperproliferation of the stem cells that, uh, in, in the gut, and that hyperproliferation is bad for the fly. It took me a while to get my head around that. But too many stem cells dividing to make too much gut wall is a bad thing. Um, and the model, or at least one of the models, is that this goes through mitochondrial ROS. So Henry's lab, Martin Borch Jensen actually did the experiments, uh, put the, the sequels and the cycles into this system. We, we just added it to the food and said, will we see anything? And the answer is yes, you see something. So here's DMSO, the compounds are all in DMSO, so we had to do that as the control. 
and this measures the number of stem cells by a phosphohistone H3 antibody. Uh, when you add tunicomycin to stimulate the ER stress response, you get a big increase in the number of positive cells. And if we co-add the cycles, then we can significantly decrease that response. And this is a, a non-tunicomycin system using a, a RAS mutant, which is a temperature-sensitive mutant that achieves the same thing, an ER stress. And again, we can protect against that. So this has nothing to do with tunicomycin. This is to do with ER stress. Yeah. We don't know. I mean, we haven't done any test other than this one to find that out. So there I fall back onto my different cycles work. You wouldn't expect the same off-target effect from two different structures who only, whose only common thing is they came out of our screen. But we don't formally know whether that's the case. So we think what's going on here is that ER stress is activating a pathway. Henry in his lab uh, and the literature say that this is probably junk and a protein called SAB which somehow, and we're very interested in what that how is, is causing the mitochondria to make uh, more superoxide at complex one through the 1Q site by the cycles, and also because the sequels work at complex three. And that's leading to a signal which then goes on to drive stem cell hyperproliferation. This is a signaling pathway, and we can identify the um, ob obligate requirement for mitochondrial ROS production as a, an integral part of that signaling pathway from the ER to the mitochondria back out to the cell. This was the one in two colors, uh, so somewhere between signaling and damage. Um, this is tunicomycin stress in in-swan mammalian cells, a mammalian um, insulinoma cell line. And what we can show there is that the caspase activation by tunicomycin, which shows that the cells are signaling apoptosis, that caspase response can be suppressed uh, by using the sequels. So the complex three site is part of that signaling pathway, again, from the ER stress to the downstream effector pathway, in this case, commit suicide response. And we can also do it in the absence of overt ER stress by uh, taking out the pancreatic islets, taking a leisurely 24 hours or 48 hours to get to the assay point. Uh, there's a lot of oxidative damage that goes on, and you get a uh, greatly re decreased pancreatic function. And if we uh, perfuse the pancreas with the sequels, then we can protect against that. So we get more cells after we, uh, the black bar, after we perfuse with a sequel. Uh, we get more beta cells in, in the islets that we pull out, and those beta cells have a better glucose, um, uh, glucose-sensitive insulin secretion response. So we can protect, protect against either signaling, if you think that's what it is, or overt damage, if you think that's what it is, uh, against that oxidative stress showing that 3QO site is responsible or at least uh, a, a major contributor or is required for uh, that oxidative damage response, which leads to the signaling of the caspases or the overt decrease in the functionality of the tissue. And that obviously is of interest in terms of um, tissue transplantation as a potential maneuver to get better quality tissues. And then the final example is ischemia reperfusion injury. So it's become suggested in the literature recently that one of the main things that goes on during ischemia and reperfusion is that succinate builds up during ischemia. So succinate can appear as a, a product of succinate dehydrogenase going backwards to accept electrons when oxygen is, is not present. So you get some reversal of the succinate dehydrogenase acting as a fumarate reductase, and succinate builds up in the cytosol. And that in itself is not harmful. It might even be slightly helpful to allow you to run a few more electrons and do a bit more uh, NADH turnover. But then when you reperfuse, the idea in the literature is that succinate now drives ROS production through site 1Q. And that 1Q ROS production causes the ischemia reperfusion injury. And we think that's, that looks like it's correct. So this is a Langendorf perfused heart, uh, six different hearts. Uh, we, uh, this is done by Paul Brooks's lab in Rochester. Yves Wang actually did the experiments. Uh, so you take the heart, you measure the rate times pressure product, which is a, a heart function assay. And we set the initial value to 100% in all of the hearts. 
you then just leave them ischemic for 20 minutes. During that time, the succinate is supposed to build up. This in itself is, is not thought to be very damaging um, because the heart can recover. And then in this green period here, we reperfuse with or without uh, the cycles, cycle 1.1, one of our cycles. So the tissue only sees at the point of reperfusion. This is the point where the surgeon opens you up and puts the stent in, uh, and everything starts to reperfuse. And then at that point, um, and then we wash that out after 10 minutes and then let the heart progress. And in the controls, you get a damaged heart, damaged by ischemia reperfusion injury. Uh, and it has a, an infarct volume which you can measure in the heart's post-experiment. Uh, but if we perfuse in the presence of the cycle, just for that 10 minutes and then wash it out, we get a substantial protection. And that's consistent with the model that ischemia causes succinate accumulation, which drives site 1Q to make ROS, which causes damage during injury. And the cycles are protective against that ischemia reperfusion injury. So we think what we have is a, a starting collection of biologically and pathophysiologically relevant phenotypes. All of them need more work. Uh, to work them up properly, uh, which demonstrate that site1q and site3qo actually do run in cells, and that they are involved in signaling pathways, and that they are also potentially involved in damage pathways, and that in each case, the, the compounds that we have are able to decrease or, or suppress that damage or that signaling. Uh, so we have both a tool which allows us to analyze what's the importance of these different sites in ROS production, and also potentially a, a route to a therapeutic that could stop it happening in any situation that we might be interested in, one of which obviously is aging. Uh, in case you got confused about my switching between the different compounds, I just coded this. The 1Q ones are in purple on the left and the 3Q ones are in red on the right. And some of the reactions are prevented by both. Some of them are either prevented only by one or we've only tested one. Uh, so it looks like there's some selectivity there. Okay, so what I've tried to persuade you of is that mitochondria are not a black box, that you can get inside the box and you can really dissect out what's going on. And when you do that, there are 11 sites, there may be some more, but we presume there, there's nothing major that we've missed uh, that are able to make superoxide. And we can characterize them in the regular way that you can characterize the enzymes of glycolysis, for example. You can get to know their properties when they run, when they don't run, uh, and really understand what makes them go. Their contributions change um, both in terms of the, the total signal and their relative contributions when you bring the changes with different substrates. If we do the best mimic we can of physiological conditions, then four of those sites dominate. And we have these cells, these selective electron leak inhibitors, which can suppress two of those sites. We haven't got good cells for the other two yet. And they do all these interesting things, and they, they show a great deal of promise for the future. And the work was all done by a group of postdocs and research associates in the lab, a very talented group. All except one have now moved on, and the current work is being done by this set of equally talented individuals. And I'd like to thank my collaborators in the buck, uh, Bob Hughes and Ed Ainsco at GNF and Paul Brooks and, and their labs at Rochester, and of course the funders. And, and thank you for your attention. So we, we make the assumption that RNA has no function in the system other than to make proteins. Mm -hmm. And that, therefore, the question is, uh, does the concentration of different subunits matter? And I don't know the answer to that. I, I'm working under the simplifying assumption, except for the oxoacid dehydrogenases, that a subunit either gets integrated into a complex or gets degraded, and we can forget about it. That probably is not true for the oxoacid dehydrogenases, where the lipomide dehydrogenase may 
under some or even all circumstances be floating around and doing things. And it's, uh, that's not shown up in our experiments as a missing contributor, but it possibly may. Uh, but then at the level of the complexes, of course you're right, that differences in the levels of complexes will have big impacts on the capacities, and I presume on the native rates, although we haven't looked at that. Uh, the, the, the two cells, the cycles and the sequels. Yes, in most of these systems, we've played around with that. And the answer is probably yes. There should be, because they're supposedly going after different sites with no effects on anything else. So their effects should be strictly additive until you get to saturation of the phenotype that you're measuring. And what we find is that you do tend to get bigger effects when you add two than when you add one. But at the moment, we're, we're in and out of the noise. So it's hard to say that that's really true, and we need to do more to, to establish that, it's, that it is true. It's obviously important in terms of the model I'm trying to present. Yeah. So, will you keep the uniform and If, if we suppress a site, where do the electrons go instead? Is that the question? Yes. So the first part is, although I didn't show you, that in various cells, we, we put them into the seahorse with the compounds, and the compounds don't do anything. So we are confident in at least some of the models where we've tested it that there's no effect on oxidative phosphorylation in cells. Where do the electrons go? Uh, depends on, you, you'll think that's a problem if you think a large proportion of the electrons are going onto superoxide. So when we stop it, things change. But actually, a tiny proportion of the electrons is going onto oxygen to make superoxide or hydrogen peroxide. It's some fraction of 1%, uh, maybe 0.03% or something. Uh, so when you stop it, it just makes no difference to the energetics. It, it's a change within the noise of the, the normal energetics. Uh, so we don't see any increases in respiration, for example. And we wouldn't expect to, because they'll be hidden within the error bars of our determinations of oxygen consumption rate. So we think that there's no problem with what you do with the electrons. They just go down the normal pathway, and that it's an, it's an insignificant change in those pathways. So we thought once we got to that point, this is a really interesting experiment to do. Um, so we got hold of young and old rats, um, expecting to see a difference in the ROS production. And we were then going to dissect it out and find out which site was changing so we could explain the age-dependent changes in ROS production. And what we found is absolutely no difference in the ROS production from the young and the old. So we weren't able to then answer any further question because there was no phenotype there. And we haven't gone back to deeply analyze why we don't see something that some other people in the literature see. I wonder if there's a reporting bias. If other labs find no change, they're going to tend to do what we've done and not publish it. And if they do see a change, they'll publish it. So there may be a, a reporting bias on the size and the um, reproducibility of the effects. Uh, but we can't see effects with, with the, the rats that we use. They were quite old. They were. I forget the exact age, but uh, at the age where we were starting to worry about the numbers dropping off due to dying of old age. And the young ones were typical young adults of six weeks, I think, or something. So we, we had the range, and we just didn't see anything. So yeah, it's a shame. I would rather we saw something so we could analyze it. Well, I was also wondering about the implications of that on the ability of these uh, drugs That, that's very true. Um, we were looking in skeletal muscles, so maybe it's different in other tissues. So that would be my defense. But you're right. In, in principle, that's not a, an encouraging sign. 
for uh, beta T specifically. So I, th I think we now have two ways to address that question, and we haven't done it. One way is to replicate the muscle uh, exercise experiment, where instead you use mitochondria from an obese or a, a, some other metabolic syndrome challenge model versus a control in a medium which mimics the metabolites measured in all of those things. And to the extent that you trust me and believe all my assumptions with the muscle, that would also apply in terms of ROS production in, in that model. We haven't done it because it's not a trivial thing to do, obviously. And the other way, which may be easier to do, is to use the cycles and the sequels as tools in cell models of obesity. And they don't work in animals very well yet, uh, but they work in cell systems. And again, we haven't done that, but that would be interesting to do. So I don't know the answer empirically, uh, but I think we now have a better tool set to address it. So the, we were driving in those experiments the hyperproliferation by ER stress, either with tunicomycin or with um, a mutant RAS. And so we just had a, a yes-no answer. Uh, it would be possible to do more subtle experiments looking at age dependence and things, and those we, we simply haven't done. Uh, lack of time and effort and resources, I guess. A lot of questions for you. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Just, just have a minute, and we'll let you ask the question. Yeah. So, the last, what the last level is the size of the insulin distribution? So, it were somehow the size of the insulin distribution. Um, so, there's a number of levels I could answer that at. Uh, in the one I showed you, it was a damage model where we were using GSIS as a model for how good is the islet. Um, the question you're asking is just can you modulate it without that underlying damage? And the answer is we haven't done it, so we don't know. Um, and then the, the more subtle answer is if ROS is being used as a signal in such a system for which there's a literature, but I don't know if it's true that it really is or not, uh, then again we have the tools which would allow us to pick out which site it is. And it might be that uh, some particular site is responsible for insulin resistance, for example, uh, because of the topology or because that's the site that, that's increased for some other reason. So it might be that we could prevent um, pathological production of ROS from particular sites while leaving the background ROS production from the other sites intact. So if there's background signaling from some sites and aberrant from other sites, we might be able to take out the aberrant and leave the background in place. So I think they're quite powerful tools to address it, both as a scientific question, is it happening, and then potentially as a therapeutic question. But, but I don't know. We haven't done it. Okay, Shane, quickly, your question. Oh, Martin, thank you. Uh, so sitting here thinking about your results, uh, it's great work, uh, but trying to figure out how those chemicals that you pulled out might be working. I mean, you guys must have come up with a bunch of, of possibilities, because mm -hmm. just sitting there now, I come up with a bunch. But did you actually test any? I mean, so ones that I can think of, uh, uh, just looking at the structures that you pulled out, uh, they're large ring compa uh, compounds, so maybe they're act acting as uh, electron shuttles to cytochrome C, and you wouldn't detect that in your assays if it's only 0.03%. Um, another one might be that it's affecting uh, super complex assembly and some of those sites might be masked, masked in, a su in a super complex. Um, uh, they might facilitate superoxide dismutation. If you, anything like that. I mean, you guys tested any of them? And clearly we're interested in the mechanism of action. Uh, yeah, I can think of many other possibilities in addition to the ones that you suggested. Uh, our 
favorite model is that we are tweaking the, the rate constants for the reaction of oxygen plus electron goes to superoxide by conformational changes driven by binding at other sites. Uh, but there's really no evidence one way or the other about that. And at the moment, we're doing experiments where we're doing competition studies between the different cycles, for example, asking do they compete with each other for their effect, uh, and asking do they affect the rotenone binding. They clearly don't affect the electron transport, forward electron transport through the complex, uh, but they do seem to be interacting with the rotenone binding, suggesting that, uh, well, you can interpret that in many ways, but one of the suggestions would be that they're slightly modifying the, the shape of the rotenone binding site, the Q binding site. Uh, but the other things that you suggested are possible, obviously, and it's quite hard to think of clean experiments that can address them. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, just thinking about your, uh, your observation with the HIF-1, uh, it reminded me that the uh, proline hydroxylase that would otherwise uh, hydroxylate the HIF-1 and send it off to the trash can. That's one of those iron, uh, 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 iron requiring enzymes, the alpha-ketoglutarate alpha uh, dependent hydroxylases. And that might be how it's working. They're just oxidizing that iron 2 to iron 3. So what we can show is that other ways of activating the HIF pathway, which are going at that level, are not affected by the cycles directly, by the, by the sequences in this case, directly. Uh, so we think it's a Ross effect, not a direct effect at that level of the, the redox chain. But we don't know which components of that signaling pathway might be the primary receiver of the signal from the mitochondria. We're pretty confident it is a signal from the mitochondria. Well, thanks. Thanks again. With that, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Friend for the wonderful seminar. Thank you. Thank you.